We're at seven o'clock, so we're going to get started. I'm Ellie Dix from Pivotal Education, and I'd like to introduce Paul Dix. Hello, I'm Paul Dix from Pivotal Education. I've got my Pivotal podcast mug and a cup of tea, so I'm absolutely ready to go. I really hope that you've enjoyed those first two units to set you up for the next three. We're going to answer some questions. We're going to tease you a bit uh, in terms of what the content might be in the next three units. And we're going to try and deal with some common worries that people have about uh, certainly managing your own behavior, using your own behavior to influence others, and rules, rituals, and routines. In fact, today I've just come back from the Pixel Conference in London, and we've been talking very deeply about those two things. And the mantra for me at the moment is around when the adults change, everything changes. And I think that's as true in a classroom as it is for whole school behavior issues. Uh, And so that first chapter about really just tweaking your behavior is at the core of great behavior management. You can't lay strategy on a sinking foundation. You need that foundation of really good adult behavior, stripping out the emotion, staying calm in a crisis and pouring your positive energy into when learners are doing the right thing. So I know Ellie's got some questions um, and uh, Ellie can fire away. Let's uh, let's get cracking. Yes, absolutely. We've got a few questions that have come in on the uh, forums on the online course and um, I've picked up on a couple of comments as well in other discussion forums. Um, What we're going to do is we're going to run through some of them. Who knows how many we'll get through? And of course, we won't get through everybody's questions. We'll try and pick out some from the the live uh, the live questions on the discussion as well. Um, But uh, we're going to just before we start, some people have asked about how you should deal with Callum, the student in the video clip. And we've got a couple of other video clips there which show you different ways the teacher could deal with Callum. So you can see them, they're also in the webinar discussion forum for you. So Paul, let's crack on then. And um, the first questions come from Dean Noble. He asks, when the whole class is doing a task, how do you get their attention and bring them back? Okay, that's a great question. And if you go to different schools, you'll see different people using different mechanisms. In primary school, you see kind of the classic hands up, the teacher standing there with the hand up, waiting for the class to put their hands up. You, you might also hear sort of clapping rhythms in primary that the learners have to respond to. You know, I, I prefer working with any age of learner to use a countdown, but it's not just a simple countdown, it's an embellished countdown. The problem I have with raising your hand or doing clapping techniques with the children is that you're relying on them to respond to you. You're waiting for them to respond before you can move on with the lesson. And I think it's critical that when you call the learners to order, that that's your decision, that you're not waiting for them. You're driving the pace of the lesson and when you need to speak and need to interject into their learning, even just for a brief moment, they need to come to order very quickly. So what I would do with my learners is teach them a, five, uh, a countdown from five to begin with. And I'd embellish that with positive recognition so that I can keep it on the good foot all the time. So five, fantastic. You're back at your benches. You've cleared your stuff away. That's great, that group. Four. Okay, Daniel, can you just sort those stools out and come back round to the front? Three. And now you've got eyes on me. That's spot on. Two. And Chardonnay, you're nearly there. One. Half. And over time, I train the children in that routine. Uh, After two or three weeks, I'll cut it down to a three, two, one. But I'll always use the positive embellishment. You could, of course use a countdown with lots of negative embellishment. Five, why aren't you sitting down? Four, this is a disaster. By the time you get to one, you've either given out too many sanctions or the whole atmosphere in the room has just sort of crumbled in that negativity. So I think 
you know, that countdown, the positive embellishment, be prepared if learners don't come to order when you've gone from half to zero. You know, they'll need their private warning. They'll, they'll need their reminder, perhaps. Um, you can't just ignore that. Or they might just need a quiet word after you've got the rest of the group back onto work. But an embellished countdown is really effective. The, the key, of course, is the repetition of that routine. So don't try it once and then think, well, I didn't go quite as I wanted. I'll, I'll try something else tomorrow. You just routine them in it. Uh, by the end of week one, they'll be coming to order on zero. By the end of week two or three, you can go three, two, one. Most of the classes I, go, I, 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 talk, you know, I work with, we go from two down to one, down to zero pretty quickly. If the children count with you, that's fine <laughs> because you've got their attention and they're playing along. They won't continue to do that. So that agreed signal driven by you, making sure that you're not waiting, that you're getting immediate attention when you need it, and then applying negative consequences if you have to at the end of that. Great. Paul, we've got a couple of comments on the, um, the live discussion here. And somebody asking, Jacqueline's asking about, do you always keep the length the same? of the countdown or do you alter it for different situations? Yeah, I think I, I sort of start long and get shorter and shorter. I don't really want to be going from five every time. You know, uh, three, two, one, I can do quite quickly. We can play a little game with it. I've seen other teachers use music to do the same thing. But the, the trouble is that I, you know, when I do a countdown, I don't really want to uh, wind the children up. So if you are using music, select it carefully. Uh, but it's again, it's an agreed cue. And lots of people use sort of timers and countdown timers on the PowerPoint, but but they don't have the positive recognition with them. And I think that's the key. Whatever you use, catch those learners who immediately turn to you or immediately come to their place, back to their group, start clearing away, line up, whatever it might be, and immediately give them acknowledgement. What's key here is that you don't overpraise. Acknowledgement is enough. A thank you, uh, a, a well done is fine. You don't need to lavish praise on those learners, otherwise it becomes a, a little bit odd. Okay, great. Thanks, Paul. Let's move on to question two. Um, we've had actually three or four questions which are essentially the same, and lots of different people asking in the same way. How do you respond to students comparing you to another teacher? When, it, when the other teacher allows you to do things, allows them to do things that you don't let them. You know, what, what do you do when they say, Mr. So-and-so lets us do this? Yeah, you inwardly scream and, and wish that you had a consistent behavior policy throughout the school that was supporting you. That's clearly the first thing that you do. Um, the second thing is to explain to those learners that when they walk through your door, uh, you know, there is almost a sign above your door that says, this is how we do it here. And the way that you manage behavior with your class, your children, is not in comparison to other classes. Just like as a parent, you, you, you wouldn't get into that game of being you know, compared to your partner uh, through your child when you're trying to manage, manage their behavior. So I think, you know, not to criticize other teachers in the way they do it, but to, to say to the children, say to the learners, yeah, that's how Mrs. Harris does it. When you walk into my room, there are clear routines. The rules are the same, uh, and I'm going to enforce those rules, but you know my classroom, you're walking into a laboratory, you're walking into a maths classroom, a design technology studio, and, there, and different rules apply. It's almost at the threshold, which is why that meet and greet is not just a sort of smiley dance. So, uh, uh, it, it's also a structured entry into the room. It's also reminding them of the responsibilities. And I think if you're having that issue, it, I would be reminding the learners as they're walking in. You remember what I'm really fussy about. You remember our routine. Thank you so much, Daniel. You're straight onto the routine, spot on, great work. I'm not sure that you can waste any time comparing yourself to other teachers and I and I've you know I, my working career has been spent in schools where I, I feel like I'm trying to create an oasis in total chaos so I really have worked in those systems where there's no support where sending learners to, to a senior leader is, is totally counterproductive and so I understand the difficulty there and the tension of it children like to divide and rule 
And of course, some children who have fairly chaotic home lives outside of the classroom will have learned very, very early on, particularly with parents who have separated, that they can play divide and rule brilliantly. I can go to mum and say that, that dad didn't you know, do this or give me that, and maybe mum feeling guilty will patch it, I go back to dad. So they're just trying to put a wedge in between you. The key in terms of whole school policy and whole school adult behavior is to create that consistency where there are no gaps. But I appreciate that you may not have the control over that level of policy and all you can do is try to establish consistency within your room. If you need to, have a look at your door, the entry to your lab, the entry to your room and think about what messages are on that door. Uh, lots of teachers will put, you know, when you walk through this door, expect to be challenged, expect to be stretched, expect, you know, that you'll have a list of, of different expectations and do something to make it really clear that they've walked through a, a threshold, they've walked over the threshold and things have changed. That behavior may work out there. It may be that in your maths class, different behaviors seem to work. But when you walk into my classroom, when you walk into this faculty, this is how we do it here. And that is not an instant solution. As with all of this behavior management work, this is about the drip, drip, drip feed every single day. Just because you stand at the door one day, or you go in tomorrow, stand at the door, put some posters up, put some lovely uh, clear signs up, it doesn't mean that their behavior is going to change overnight. So we talk constantly about that 30 day period. You're gonna start something new, you're gonna try and change a behavior, adjust a routine, give yourselves 30 days and make sure that thing remains the main thing for those 30 days. People seem to really slip up on behavior management. When they see a strategy that they like, they think that's gonna work for me in my classroom. They try it out the next day, it doesn't work, so they just sort of reject it and think, well, I'll just go and try and find another strategy. What we want to try and do through this online course is to establish that, that firm foundation and not be thinking constantly that we're gonna go and find another strategy, uh, find another book, or surely there must be another online course because the stuff we've got here in this online course, it really does start to form that basis. So it's drip feed, it's 30 days, it's make the point at the door. And you know, sometimes when you meet and greet, you might well be smiling, welcoming, and sometimes when you meet and greet, you'll still be smiling, but you'll have your arm across the door and allow learners to come in one by one or group by group. And then you can just gently remind them, acknowledge them when they start to follow the routines. You know, part of it is that when I walk into your teaching space, apart from the door, looking at what's at the door, do I know what routine you are really working on? And I should. I should be able to walk in and see that routine on three walls. I should maybe see it laminated to the desks, uh, on cards, on the children's books, on their uh, iPads, on the screen. I will see and I will know that that routine is the one that we're working on. I like to routine children until they're utterly sick of it and they say, sir, we, we know the routine, okay, we totally know the routine. And I said, good, great, let's move on. There's a comment just come in on the um, discussion uh, from uh, Ingrid who says, okay, that's great putting routines up on the wall and referring to them, but what if you're moving every 50 minutes to a different room? How yeah, do you do that? Absolutely, yeah. Uh, okay, you have to decide then whether you're gonna go analog or digital, right? Uh, I, I uh, you know, as, I've worked as a supply teacher, I've worked as a teacher with no classroom, and my solution was an analog one. You know those big art files that people put sort of A, was it AO and A1 pieces of paper in. I would come into the room and I'd unfold the art folder and it would. I'd say to the learners, right, it's me, uh, you remember me, I'm really, really fussy about these three rules and this routine for me is really, I'm just gonna leave this here and in fact, every time, every time I catch someone following this routine, I'm just gonna write their name on it so I have a mechanism to do that. You'll see more about that in unit three about use of positive recognition in order to embed the routine so that's a, a, a bit of a teaser but you might want to go digital so if you know that you're going to have a projector and a screen in each room or you know uh, you, you've got ipads in the room you can you can flash that onto the screen and onto the ipads and the other way to do it is um, you know those sort of very cheap digital photo frames you can just 
carry one of those around, have it charged up in the morning, and it will just loop through your routine, and it will loop through your rules, and you can just leave it running and looping. Okay, great, thanks Paul. Um, I can see that, just this is a side comment really, <clears throat> I can see that a couple of uh, questions have come in about things that we're going to cover in the course in the, in the subsequent weeks, in week three, four and five. What we'll, what we'll do is we'll focus on the things that are relevant to the topics in week one and two. And if we have any time at the end, we'll come on to questions about praise and reward and um, how to deal with sanctions. So let's move on to the next question now, Paul. <clears throat> what can you do if you have a school behaviour system and a set of sanctions, but middle and senior leaders don't follow the agreed system? This is from Victoria Fletcher. Okay, again, you need to do that um, inward scream and, uh, and, and, and question your senior and, and middle leaders, but you don't have the power necessarily to change their minds. You know, the answer is that you need to create your behavior management as an oasis in your classroom. That doesn't mean you go against the school policy or never use senior leaders or middle leaders, but you start to do things slightly differently. So rather than sending children to middle leaders and senior leaders, I would be asking for them to come and stand next to you while you're talking to the child. I'd ask for them to come and support you in your classroom rather than sending them off because then you don't know what's happened to them. You've no idea because you, you've not had communication what the sanction would have been or indeed whether there's been an apology or a reparation or anything. You need to stay connected to the behavior. So I think that's a, you know, at the middle leader level and your line manager, you need to have a serious conversation with that line manager about how they can best support you in trying to maintain exceptional behavior. I would also not rely on them to follow through with sanctions. I mean, you're saying that they're not, they're not following the system, and I've seen it before, you know, middle leaders sort of scrubbing out detentions for children because they've done a deal with them and they're not communicating with you. Nothing undermines the behavior system faster than people doing that. So I would start to think about what you can do in terms of those higher level behaviors and those higher level sanctions. Look, you could certainly spend your life sticking children in detention, but you're gonna end up having to supervise that, so that's not a good solution. I really like impositions where children have to take work, meaningful work home and do extra work that night, have it signed by their parents and then brought in the next morning. As a class teacher, if I have a real problem with a child and there's been a, a you know quite a high level of, of ill discipline with them, you know, I will pick up the phone and speak to mum and dad. In most families, that is enough to make the point to the child. In some families, you won't get a support from from home. So I'm then looking not to my senior and middle leaders, but to the really experienced colleagues that I've got. And I want them to stand alongside me. Look, a great school, a great behavior management system is about all adults. When you create these hierarchies and imagine that people at the top of the chain have got magic dust, you and I both know that that's not true. And in many, many schools, it is the people teaching alongside you that have the most expertise. It is those teachers who have been teaching at the classroom level for 10 or 15 years that can really help you out. The advantage, of course, is that they often have great relationships with the, with the learners because they've been there a long time and they've got that sort of certainty about them. And they have long connections very often into the community so those parents who are being a bit awkward with you because it's the first time they've you've spoken to them you know they can start to lend you a, a bit of their help as well so it's not an ideal situation the ideal situation is to have really supportive middle leaders and, and fantastic senior leaders in your school supporting behavior visibly every single day but the situation you describe might require some temporary measures like I've just outlined before you can get to the point where you've got really good agreement between middle senior leaders and the staff body. It worries me when I hear about schools where middle leaders and senior leaders are not following through and not communicating clearly back to the class teacher because there's nothing that corrodes good behavior management faster than middle and senior leaders not following agreed policy. I, I just, you know, caveat that with, um, of course, if your policy is so long-winded that it stretches to 50 page, pages and you've got, you know, 500 rules and codes of conduct and responsibility, then 
actually nobody can follow the agreed policy. So we constantly make arguments and show schools how reducing the policy to an A4 sheet can be a really good way to make sure that everyone's following the agreed policy. If you've got a policy that runs to 50 pages, then nobody's ever going to follow the policy. Or if you've got a policy that's so woolly that just says, well, staff can decide what they want to do when they want to do it, again, you're, you're not going to have that consistency. So while you're shouting, while you're making, I'm shouting at your uh, middle and senior leaders, while you're trying to make a sensible case for reform of the behaviour policy and communication and consistency and visibility, I think you know the parents and other colleagues and in positions might be a place to start in your own classroom, lab or, or workshop. Great, thanks Paul. Um, interestingly, okay, we've got another question coming up, but we've just had a comment in the forum which relates to this next question. Okay. So um, the, the question is, I've got a student who keeps laughing for no reason at all. It becomes contagious and soon the whole class is laughing. What approaches might work here? I don't want to stop them from enjoying the lesson, but inappropriate laughter can be disruptive. And, and in the forum, we've just had yeah. a comment or a question really. Can you suggest some strategies that can be used when several students are misbehaving at the same time? Uh, so it's, it's sort of linked, I think. Okay, let's deal with the first and then we'll come to the second one in a moment. So um, my approach would be uh, to speak to that learner individually, uh, to explain why the laughter is so disruptive, to try and unearth what that is. It sounds to me like it's just simple clowning around. I mean, some children do sort of nervously laugh when you when you speak to them and, and particularly when you, when you tell them they're doing the wrong thing. It doesn't sound like that to me. It sounds like some kind of deliberate mechanism for which you know, the other children recognize and then join in with. So I would be treating that as, as, a, as a rule break. I would be taking that child away. I'd be explaining exactly what I want to see from them. And, and trying to just peel apart what the laughter is. Is it used in other classes? I'd want to teach, speak to other teachers that have got that group and see if they're doing it in that class as well as mine, or, or whether it's just about me. I'd be looking seriously at your seating plan. I would make sure that when I went back into the class, I didn't mention the conversation I'd had with that learner, but that the first time that laugh came again and it will because they're going to test you and that child will test you. you you need to quietly apply a consequence as you'll be shown in in unit four uh, you'll be able to do a, a simple intervention in stages and you need to treat that laughter as a disruptive behavior because it's taking other learners away from their learning but i think that quiet word first of all is key when you've got lots of learners disrupting Okay, look, you and I both know there is no magic solution to that. And that's a really difficult thing when groups of learners almost sort of gang up uh, and come together. So the answer is uh, uh, not a simple one, but, but you need to be a bit more strategic. So you need to be thinking carefully about those learners. Which one is the leader? Which one is going to crumble first when you uh, consider picking up the phone to their parents? which learners are just following and then you can have a quiet word and maybe they'll just back off quickly. In a group of learners who seem to be uh, um, disruptive towards you, uh, there'll always be one or two that stand out and, and a few that are following. The other thing I would do is I would, and particularly if you're new to them and you don't have that relationship with them to know that, I'd be calling on support. And again, I'd be calling on support of experienced colleagues, of form tutors, of faculty heads, uh, and if it got to the point where I felt that that group was really, uh, um, you know, sort of clinging together in terms of their disruptive behaviour, I'd be asking for, uh, I'm thinking about splitting them up for a little bit and, and pulling them apart, whether, whether that's in terms of your seating plan in the room you're working in or whether you need to park some of those learners for a couple of weeks until they can control themselves enough to come back into your classroom. But you're right, you need to take it seriously. Just because it's laughter, you know, it, it doesn't mean that it's funny for you or for the rest of the learners. It may well be just a running gag with those with those children, but it doesn't sound like it's it's uh, doesn't sound to me like anyone else is enjoying that. So uh, a, a bit of a firm hand, but also if you do speak to learners and then they go through a lesson and they don't do the laugh, you must 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 speak to them at the end or catch them in the corridor and just say thank you and then maybe remind them again, next lesson can we do the same? 
and keep reinforcing it and just try to again it's about the drip feed again just because you solve it in one lesson doesn't mean it might not reappear you need to kill these habits over 30 days not over a, 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 you know over one lesson great thanks paul okay let's move on to question five how would your approach vary when dealing with adult learners and a second part to this question also do you have any tips for mixed groups of adults and okay. children this is tom that's asked the question okay tom i you know my honest approach is i i don't really change my philosophy I don't really change my expectations of learner behavior when they're adult, but I do change my tone and I do uh, change my language somewhat so that I, I, I'm you know, trying not to be patronizing. I, I'll also make absolutely sure, I mean I do with even younger children, but I'll make absolutely sure that I do not speak to people about their poor behavior in public. It will be private, it will be, tween, be between me and that learner, and with adult learners that's critical because you know um, shaming a, a seven-year-old child uh, is one thing uh, uh, and not something i'd advise but but you know uh, uh, um shaming a 30 year old man who's who's got a family and, and a job and has come for a, a night class or come for a top-up training is a is a completely different ball game so do it privately draw them away drop down when you're speaking to them. And there are a number of other things we're gonna come in, in unit four of this course, when we look about applying those sanctions, you're gonna see that actually, the way that I'm gonna suggest you apply sanctions can work just as well for a five-year-old as it can for a 55-year-old. You need to establish the rules in your room. You need to establish uh, um, how you're gonna work the room. With adult learners, you should be asking them. Some would argue with me that with, with children, we should be constantly asking them. I. I you know, I, I, I think that that's useful once you know the group and you know the children. I'm not sure it's useful as a, a starter lesson. You know, you don't want to walk into a class and say, hey, kids, tell me what the rules should be when, when you have no relationship and no knowledge of them whatsoever. So with adult learners, um, I, I, I would establish three clear expectations with them and, and suggest what they might be. You know what else I do? I, I do one of our trainers, um, Arnie Skelton, I was working with him uh, for the last couple of days. And, and one of the things he does with adult learners is he gives them a pass. So what he says is, um, you know, if I ask you to do something and you're not, you know, you don't particularly want to do it, I ask you to stand up and present, or I ask you to share an idea with the group, and, and, and you're, you're a bit stuck, you're not quite sure, you're allowed to say pass, but you can only pass once in the lesson. And that's a really nice agreement. So if the adult feels that they don't want to be exposed, that actually that's not really what they want, you know, they don't want to answer that question or they're not quite sure, they can offer a pass. I think you do the same thing with young children. When you've got mixed uh, adults and normally older learners, I think that the same expectations have to apply throughout. And you also have to be even more careful that you are not uh, um, talking to adults about their poor behavior in front of the children. That's a very sensitive area, but again, contract the behavior with them if you know them. Otherwise, why not just go for ready, respectful, safe, simple rules, clear for everyone, uh, and let's start moving on. Again, don't imagine that adult learners don't love a bit of positive reinforcement, uh, a bit of positive acknowledgement, and a bit of praise as well, because they love it. It's a human thing, not necessarily age-related. Great, thank you Paul, okay. Question six, I get really angry when students engage in behavior which is detrimental to themselves. I can control myself when poor behavior is directed at me, but I furiously shout when they're damaging themselves in some way. Any suggestions for how I can deal with these situations? That's from Sergio. Yeah, I, I get it Sergio, uh, that, that you know, what you feel most passionately about is, is them ruining their chances to, to be successful, absolutely. But raising a voice at them and getting frustrated it is not going to modify their behavior. In fact, it, it may well be that it starts to cement it. They're getting a big reaction from you. Uh, and you're showing them that a small behavior from them gets a big reaction. Now, some children will be tempted just to repeat that. So I think the issue here is with you, you need to strip out the negative emotion. You need to refuse, refuse to reward, essentially what you're doing, reward those learners by shouting at them and by giving them your negative emotion and save your 
emotion and save your emotional energy for when things are going right, for when they're doing the right things, for when they're showing great effort and, and, and diligent and resilient and, and, and really deep into the work. And it's tough, uh, you know, and, and it's something that you have to work on, I have to work on, every single teacher has to work on. But there's no evidence that, that showing and shout, showing your negative emotion and, and shouting at, at learners does anything productive. In fact, as we've seen through Unit 1, it shuts down uh, their rational brain, it turns them into emotion, and you know, people don't learn uh, uh, in an emotional state. In fact, they're thinking about getting out of the room or avoiding the work or just burying their head on, into the desk. So I think whilst you feel passionately about it, I think you need to take some time and, and perhaps in unit five of this course when we start looking at restorative practice and reflective conversations with learners that will be the point at which you need to address it with them so I don't think you should not address it but I think you need to do that in a, a more controlled way and maybe say to them okay I'm not going to talk to you about that now but we do need to have a, a 10 minute conversation about that and then plan what you're going to say and say it with passion and say it with with the enthusiasm but just try and leave the anger out there's that balance isn't there between adults who are enthusiastic and passionate and determined and those that sort of just go over that boundary to angry and maybe a bit nasty you just need to keep yourself the other side of the line and show them that that you care about their behavior you care about their learning but but actually it's it even though it is and you're hiding it, it it's not it's not provoking your emotional response it's a hard one and teachers spend you know their whole careers uh, bef you know you can spend years till you get to the point where where you really are in control of that if you are really struggling with your own emotion I'll give you a tip okay um, but I, I don't want you to give this tip to the learners uh, one of the ways that people stop themselves becoming angry or stop themselves becoming emotional or stop themselves crying is to pinch themselves and hurt themselves. That pain signal immediately distracts the emotional brain. That's why when you're at a wedding and uh, the, 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 the bride's walking down the aisle and you start to well up with tears that people sort of dig their nails into their legs to stop themselves crying or bite their lip to stop themselves crying. So. Okay, I, I know through this online course I appear to be the most rational and calm person uh, alive. Uh, Ellie will contest to the fact that I am certainly not. Mm -hmm. And I have, you know, I come to this because I have my own struggles with, with anger and, and with, with frustration. So I will very often um, have an elastic band on my wrist and I'll ping it when I feel my anger rising. It doesn't solve it. It will stop it in the moment and allow you to focus on the rational response. But you're then going to have to have some time, go for a run, uh, have a bottle of Pinot Grigio, uh, talk it through with someone in the staff room. Um, you're going to need to, to you delaying it. The reason I would not be talking to the children about that is because if you give them the connection that physical pain takes away their emotional pain, that for some children that's a route to self-harm. And I work with a lot of learners who, who, who have struggle with real emotional trauma and they have already worked out that causing pain to themselves shuts down their emotional response. So don't give that connection to the learners, but for yourself, you know, you'll, you'll find, uh, you know, I, I've sometimes, I particularly when I go on airplanes, I, I sort of have to, have to really deal with that emotional response and I, I find my, uh, my wrist sort of pinched uh, with little welts where I've been just trying to get myself back onto the rational tip. Great, thanks Paul. Um, okay, there's quite a lot of interesting comments coming in on the, on the discussion. Oh, great. Um, and we'll try and come back to a couple of them later, I think. Uh, but I just want to, to just pick up on something. Someone has said might work with the students too, but I'd like to reinforce what Paul said. It's probably best not teach this strategy to your students. We don't want to get them all self-harming, do we? No, we really don't want to teach that to the learners unless it's done in a structured uh, uh, course around anger management, around uh, therapeutic approaches. I, I really wouldn't want um, learners, and I always, you know, in, in, through the training, I always emphasize that I don't want that connection being given to learners because what happens is, uh, 
for, for particularly in, in children, the more emotional pain they suffer, the more they have to hurt themselves to get that release. And it's kind of a, a never-ending circle. If you're using it just to stem your anger, that's one thing. It, but learners will be will start to use it regularly and start to realize that within that pain there is release and uh, we, we don't want to do that. So that's definitely a strategy for adults. Okay, great, thank you. And um, just going back to the, the discussion again, quite a lot of people asking about things which are essentially uh, what to do when things are going wrong. I just want to remind everybody that in week four you're going to get quite a lot of information from the course about that. And uh, we're just going to move on now with question seven. How can you deal with a student who enters the room with an obvious intention of disrupting the class? Excellent. Possibly because they're in a temper from a previous lesson. Um, yeah, and there are a couple of comments about this as well um, okay. in the forum. Okay, so uh, clearly your meet and greet is critical, but often these learners come in after you've done the meet and greet. I understand that. So you need a procedure on your door for learners that come in late. You might consider, depending on the context you're working in, to have a, a routine on the door for learners who find themselves angry when they're walking in the room. Uh, I don't like learners being able to just walk into my classroom, into my lab, um, after the bell has gone, after I've done the meet and greet. There needs to be a procedure. So what do you want? Do you want them to knock and wait? Do you want them to signal to you if they're feeling upset, if they're feeling worried, and what is the agreed signal? In, in primary schools, we very often have a you know, little jar of marbles, two jars of marbles, and, and the learners will just put a marble from one jar into another as a signal to the teacher of, I'm feeling really upset, and the teacher then can find a moment to come and talk to them. So what is your procedure for learners who come late, or who, you know, do I walk straight in? Do I knock and wait? Do I walk straight in and go to my seat? Do I walk straight in and go, ta-da, I'm here, uh, which is highly disruptive? Or is there a more controlled way to do that? For me, I, I put some seats by the door. And if you're late for my lesson, you'll knock, you'll come in and you'll sit on the seat by the door and, and you'll just um, uh, uh, fill in a little form to tell me why you're late. I can then have more control over the rest of the group while I find the moment to come and talk to those learners. It may be I'm talking to them because they're late. It may be I'm talking to them because they're upset. Here's the problem. You cannot have a hard and fast rule about how to deal with learners who are upset because some learners will be genuinely upset. Some learners pretend to be upset in order to get out of your lesson. Some learners will be upset every day. Some learners you'll see uh, uh, who have never been upset before and, and you differentiate your response to those different situations but I think again it's about the routine if we go back to unit two it's about what routine do you have in place for learners who are feeling wobbly for learners who are coming in late and how are they signaling that to you without disrupting the rest of the learning brilliant thanks Paul um, okay question eight can you explain a bit further what you mean by your behavior your choice your consequence okay the traditional way of uh, I'm being kind the traditional way of dealing with behavior is that the learner has to respond to the emotional response of the adult so you see people telling off children castigating them you have annoyed me so you're now getting my emotional response to your poor behavior now that route doesn't teach the learner self-discipline it teaches the learner that this teacher with a big voice, the angry man, is in control of your behavior. So actually what happens is the learner starts to pass responsibility over to you. I don't want that. I mean, it, you might feel, and, and you might have spoken to many teachers, particularly those who use a sort of a hostile approach to behavior management, they will tell you that they're a bit shouty and they're a bit angry and they get their needs met. They do. The problem is they don't meet the needs of the learner the learner just learns discipline to one big roaring lion. They don't help the behavior management and the conduct in the rest of the school or the college because you've just taught them to behave to one person. So that root of your behavior, my emotion, I grab a big stick to try and crush it, it is just a madness. I mean, if that worked, none of us would be talking about behavior. We just punish children they change their ways and we move on. The truth is we need to teach self-discipline. Not, not only because I want the child to be able to interact 
and take advice and take guidance from any adult they come across in the in the institution but also because I want my learners to leave my primary school, secondary school, FE college, I want them to leave as self-disciplined learners. And, and if they're not, if I've just taught them to be compliant to one angry adult, they're gonna walk out into the workplace, into further education, and they're gonna come across people who, who, who treat them in a very different way, and they have no self-discipline, it's going to go wrong very, very quickly. So what I want to do is say to the learners, this is your choice. It's your behavior, it's your choice, and if you choose the right way, you get a positive consequence. If you choose the wrong way, it's a negative consequence. But the relationship between me and the learner is never at stake. I want the learner to see their own choices in terms of, this is how I behaved, that was my choice, and now I know I'm gonna to have to either you know, I'm going to have to pay for it through the negative consequences or I'll receive a positive consequence. I don't want them to be thinking that, um, you know, or, or, or the teacher to be laying down a white glove every time there's a problem. You know, you behave badly, you promised me this, you've, you know, and suddenly it becomes personal. And the child immediately thinks that every time they have a wobble, every time they have a slightly tricky day, their relationship with this adult is suddenly at risk. Now that's, that's really not good because most of the learners who really struggle to behave are struggling with relationships outside of the school with adults as well. I want to keep the line clear. This is my behavior, my choice, my consequence. And I know that whatever choice I make, my teacher still believes in me. My teacher will still have that relationship with me and nobody's gonna run off and abandon me just because I'm having a wobbly day. You know, it, it, it seems like a small point, but actually, it, it, again, it's at the core of what we do. We've got to, you know, you know yourself, those teachers at school who were tough, who were quite strict, but they still, even on your wobbliest day, even on your most difficult day, you knew that the relationship with them was not, uh, you know, was, was not being risked because of your poor behavior. And I think those teachers are the ones that sit long in the memory. Those are the teachers who, who deal with that, you know, being strict but not being nasty and constantly saying to the learner, I don't like your behaviour, but I like you and I think you've got real potential. Okay, thank you, Paul. Um, I, I picked up, when I was looking through the discussion forum, I, I picked up on a comment that somebody made. It wasn't a question. So, you know, I can't really pose it as a question. Okay. But, but, a, but a comment that I thought you might like to respond to. Okay. Um, Vict Victoria Williams has said, I like the handshaking at the beginning of a lesson. Yeah. This would have to be a whole school behavior strategy hmm. to ensure consistency, but it might calm some students down. Now, is, is that the case? Does it have to be a whole school behavior strategy to ensure consistency? Or, or can you aim to be consistent within your own practice? Yeah, and I, I, I think, again, we're down to, we would love, you know, I spend my working life uh, uh, sparking off whole school initiatives around shaking hands, looking children in the eye, smiling at them, and, and saying something positive to them. Because for me, that's a keynote routine. It starts to change loads of other routines. Just standing at the door and doing meet and greet. I, you know, I'm at Quinton Kiniston School this afternoon uh, in Westminster in London, a large urban uh, comprehensive school. And every single member of staff is at the door doing the meet and greet. It's fabulous. But don't imagine that, that it only has to be done in that way. I have, in every school, in every context that I've taught, been doing the meet and greet at the door. Whether or not the person is doing it next door, it becomes my thing. Oh, Mr. Dixie's a bit weird, he wants to shake your hand all the time, and after a week, they love it. I'll give you an example. I was working with a year one teacher, not with the whole school, not with whole school policy. And I said to her, right, um, meeting and greeting and handshaking, brilliant, works really well, used it, and she said, well, really, Paul? What, with year one children? I mean, they're kind of low down, aren't they? <laughs> really want me to shake the hand? I said, well, what I'd like to do is just try it. So do it for a week, and then tell me what happened at the end of the week. Remember, these are six-year-old children. So she did it Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and the children thought she had lost her mind. 
On Thursday, when she came into work, there were a line of children waiting for her because they wanted the handshake. And on the Friday, there were two parents in the line of children waiting to ha have a handshake with the teacher, come into the classroom and go back out again. She wrote me an email at the end of the week and said, I don't, I don't care what other people are doing. I will be doing this for the rest of my teaching career. You know, some people say to me, well, can we do high fives? Can we do kind of fist pumps? And I always come back to, no, shake the hand. It's a formal introduction to the lesson. It, it, it's an appropriate way to greet an adult. It, it's an appropriate start. It also gives them that, you know, in some, situ some situations, some schools, some learners, they don't shake anybody's hand. That's why it's a bit weird for them. And so you actually teach them a key social skill. And again, a keynote routine in order to do that. And there's nothing, uh, you know, there's nothing unsafe. There's nothing unsavory about shaking a hand. It's clean, physical touch, obvious and safe. And, and no safeguarding issues or child protection issues would come up from say, shaking a child's hand. I would not encourage teachers to start touching on the shoulder, on the head and all of that. It's a handshake. That's all it is. It's formalized. It's obvious. And if you've got a learning support assistant or any other adult in your classroom, they should be standing at the door with you doing the meet and greet together as you remind learners of the routine as you walk in. If you've got a lab technician who's sort of just uh, uh, busying them, so get them to come and do the meet and greet with you. Uh, just try it out. Thirty days of meet and greet. I don't think you'll. Um, I don't think you'll stop doing it once you've once once you've felt how positive that really is. Uh, loads of comments coming in on the on the stream now. Uh, quite, as you, interesting that you picked up on the whole safeguarding thing because there are people that are saying they've got a strict no touch policy and they're not allowed to touch the children. And of course, I, and I think this has got to fall outside that, surely. We do extensive safeguarding work. We work in uh, pupil referral units, secure accommodation, boarding schools, independent schools, primary, secondary, nursery. I have never, ever, in 25 years of working in schools, had any problem with a member of staff shaking the hand of a learner in full public view while they're coming into the classroom. And I think that's the key. You may well have a no touch policy. Uh, that worries me for a start because it, certainly in the UK, no touch policies were, were, were banned many, many years ago. There was a huge furore about it. And, and there, is no, there, there is no such thing as no touch anymore. This is about safe touch. And if we can't teach our learners that there are appropriate ways to connect with adults, with professionals in schools and in the workplace, and I think we're doing them a disservice. You know, I, 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 I don't know a better way of getting over all the talk than just offering your hand and smiling at them. And you know, that smile is the shortest distance between two people, and the handshake cements it. So, um, you know, I. I, I'd be reassured that nobody is going to come to you and say, well, you were shaking hands, it's entirely inappropriate. That's not what they mean by safe touch. Um, and something else that I want to pick up on from this conversation, mm. uh, people are saying, you know, this is not acceptable in Muslim culture and that, you know, you, you should, you know, that it's, it's a different sort of thing. But of course you worked in a school in um, inner city Birmingham where it was 98% Muslim pupils. 98% Muslim, uh, 1,800 children, and uh, the children would shake my hand and hold my hand while I'm talking to them as a natural way of greeting and talking to me. In fact, I found it when I first went in there, slightly odd that, that they wouldn't release my hand and that they were very happy to, to, to shake it and hold it. I was doing meet and greets at that school, Broadway School in Aston, in Perry Bar in Birmingham. Uh, I worked there for five years. I've worked in many, many other contexts. In fact, we work, I'm, I'm going to Egypt in January. We work in many cultures and many countries and I've never had a problem uh, and, 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 you know, with the handshake at all. Um, not from the girls or the boys. In fact, it was the boys who would offer their hand first to me anyway. And how would you deal with students who don't like to be touched? Autistic students, students with you know high sensitivity disorders, um, and those that naturally move away from that kind of um, personal interaction? I would never force it on somebody, and, and I'd differentiate. If I knew that my, some of my learners didn't appreciate that, then I would do the smile, I'd do the hello, I'd do the how was your weekend, did your team win, you've got nice shoes, like your hair today, I'd do all of that without doing the handshake. 
and I'd allow them to come to it. You, you will probably find that after a couple of weeks of everyone having their handshake and that sort of initial awkwardness about it has disappeared, some of those learners will come to the handshake gradually, never force it on them, never demand it from them. Uh, if they don't offer their hand when you offer yours, don't be upset by it. Uh, just smile, say you're pleased to see them, say it's gonna be a great lesson, thanks for coming and in you go. Exactly. Okay, there are still things pouring in, but I think we'll move on because people seem to be covering it by themselves in the okay, forum good, now. Good. Okay, so um, I found a few comments in other discussion forums within the course, and I just wanted to uh, run a couple by sure. you. Um, somebody said that deliberately catching students doing the right thing has worked very well with a low ability group but none of them want others to know that they're doing well. Is that something that you come across a lot? An awful lot, particularly when we're working in pupil referral units, and again with low ability groups, they want the praise, sometimes. Actually, quite a lot of time they're, they're a bit awkward with the praise, aren't they? And they're not quite used to it because their self-esteem is such that, that maybe it's the first time they've had that kind of praise. So uh, um, I don't think it's necessary to have it public. Um, some children don't like public praise. Well, fine, they can have private praise. They can have uh, you know, um, a quiet word, a, a small thumbs up, uh, whatever it might be that you're using. I don't think it needs to be public. I, I don't think it needs to be. I mean, does that, um, yeah, I think one of the things we did, uh, I just remember a, a pre that we worked with in Wolverhampton where the children had um, a racetrack around the room on the wall. And every time they followed the rules, uh, follow the routine, their racing car moved forward a notch and it was sort of a, a race over the week to see whose car could be first and they, they coloured the cars but they didn't want their names on them. So they knew where they were in the race but they didn't want other people walking into the room, particularly older, uh, um, older learners, younger learners, other members of staff to know where they were on that. And, and so that's an easy compromise. In fact, if your children like private praise, there's no problem with that at all. The, the key issue is that you are positively recognizing their appropriate behavior in the way that's most fitting to them, not the way necessarily that's easy to you. I mean, if you did it, you, know, you don't want to broadcast it if that's going to make them feel awkward because the next time they're, they're, they'll probably not follow your routine so keenly if they know they're going to be publicly uh, um, shown. I mean, it's the same thing at the end of the year, you know the situation, at the end of year awards, you're giving out certificates, you're giving out prizes, and there are a few children that do not want to come up to the front. Um, I don't think there's a problem with that. I think that their name's read out, that they can walk up to the front if they want to, but but we shouldn't be uh, sanctioning them for that. We shouldn't be trying to force them to do something they don't want to. Actually, the key is that they've got the award, they've got the recognition, they've got the certificate, they've got that beaming smile on their face. Job done. Excellent. Um, I think I may have just, you may have seen me trying to type something there, so I apologize. I had the settings slightly wrong. I'm trying to multitask, so apologies. Um, okay, there's another comment um, about rules this time. A student's perception of rules is that rules exist for the benefit of the teacher, not for the benefit of the student. So this is somebody that's asked their learners about the rules and what they're for. And the student's perception seems to be that they're for the benefit of the teacher, they're not for the benefit of the learner. That's, I thought that was quite an interesting comment. Someone else said that the word rules makes certain individuals yeah. try their hardest to yeah. break them in order to maintain yeah, absolutely. status. Yeah, absolutely. So why call them rules? Call them expectations. Call them the way we do things. Call them uh, how this class operates. You can take the rules word away. Uh, in fact, when we work with schools, uh, we focus on three rules, just three rules. In fact, at the moment, we've got a project going on in Wales where we have 90 schools using the same three rules, the same school policy, and they have the same training. And the impact is just incredible. So I think uh, if you don't want to use that word, don't use it. If you want to just have the rules up for a couple of weeks and, and make sure that they've got those three uh, and then take those posters down and focus just on the routines, that's also fine. I think that uh, I think your students sound very intelligent, actually. I think your students sound very perceptive. And if they think that the rules exist for the benefit of the teacher, I think you need to just maybe twist your expectations in terms of shaping your rules, your expectations to learning. So instead of having rules that are purely behavioral, 
uh, have something around determination, around resilience, around uh, re you know, uh, determination to succeed, and make them and, and show them that those certainly are rules about the learning. They're not rules about the teaching. Excellent, thank you. Interestingly, now there are lots of things coming in about uh, rewards and recognition and praise. Great. And don't forget, we're moving on to all of that in week three. People are talking about phone calls home working really well. And you'll see when Brilliant. you see the content in week three that Paul agrees with you. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, okay, uh, we've got a question that's just come in slightly earlier. We're, we're in the last five minutes now, and I picked out a couple of questions. Okay. From the from the from the discussion during during here. Um, so, what do you do? What do you say when disruptive students ask you if you're picking on them? Is this something about maybe uh, those cul-de-sacs that I've heard you talk about before? And sometimes and I might appear to be unfair. Is my standard <laughs> is my standard response? What you need to do when students argue with you weirdly is to agree with them. And there's a teaser because that is going to come on unit four and I will explain that in full detail and I'm going to explain to you in unit four how you can turn an argument to your advantage, how you can use some stock phrases to, to allow learners to know that you've listened to them and that you hear them, not that you necessarily agree with them. I'm going to show you a few techniques to avoid those little cul-de-sacs because you know you're picking on me if it essentially is a defensive mechanism. It normally comes after you've given them a sanction and let's be honest, if you give a learner a sanction and they complain about it, it, it it's kind of working because they don't like it. So you would expect that sort of defensive reaction, but we are really gonna unpack that in the fourth unit of this course. And I'm gonna give you some very practical advice on what to say, how to say it, um, and which sentence stems work best when you're dealing with learners who are, who are tempting to, to argue with you constantly. And presumably part of that is also about trying to get a reaction out of you. Yeah. And that's where all the stuff from week one and managing your own behavior comes in. It's a secondary behavior, isn't it? it I mean, if they, uh, you know, the primary behavior is the one that you've been speaking to them about. If you then start arguing with them, with them about, you're picking on me, no I'm not, yes I am, no I'm not. We're now talking about teacher behavior. We, we've lost the throwing of the pen, the coming in late, the the breaking of the, the you know, the breaking of the equipment and, and suddenly they've diverted the conversation. That's deliberate from them. If they can divert the conversation onto you and not onto their behavior, they don't have to take responsibility for it. So it is a tactic they're using. Don't get drawn into it. Resist the, the opportunity to resist chasing secondary behaviors because it's a total madness and concentrate on the primary behavior. You know, um, uh, it, 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 you, you might use phrases like, you know, you might think like that but I'm here to talk to you about the behavior that I saw. Again, week four is the one for you. Okay, thank you. Um, and finally, uh, last question. Yeah. Uh, does calling for support make you appear weak? Oh, I look, I've typed that wrong because I tried to do it surreptitiously. The does calling for support make you appear weak? No, uh, uh, not at all. Uh, if you're calling for support for the right reasons, you've used the agreed policy, you've problem solved rather than just gone through a process and you're not pressing the button every five minutes and, and crying wolf, which I'm sure you're not, then why would it be weak? Actually, the children very often need to see that the adults working with them are a team. And sometimes we need to do that physically by calling on support. Now, when that support arrives, that's a critical moment because when the support arrives, if you then say, look at this child, Mr. Davis, I'm glad you've come, it's been awful, you undermine yourself. You give the power to the person arriving. So if you call for support, uh, lots of schools will, will ask for support. They'll either get the two adults speaking to the child or the adult on support will come in and take the class while you go out and speak to the child in private and speak to them about their behavior and see if they're able to come back in and, and carry on with the learning. Um, I think support is absolutely essential. As a teacher myself in, a, you know, in very chaotic environments, I had to call on support in my first year of teaching a lot. And I felt that same thing. Do, am I looking weak here? Am I looking like I can't control it? But actually, it's about how you manage that support. If you immediately defer to the person coming, you are undermining yourself. If you are calm, uh, uh, if you have gone through the right steps, 
if you can organize that support and be prepared when it arrives so that you are still leading and most importantly if that child is taken away you are the person that deals with it do not allow people to take children away from your classroom punish them deal with them and then not not have you in that conversation that is awful because you know what happens they come in the next day they've got that cheeky smile on their face that says ha ha you couldn't deal with me but he did and and that it is you know that that's that's corrosive in terms of your standing your authority with that group you have to follow up you have to take that 5 minutes to to go and see that child as soon as you can or go and see the member of staff who dealt with them in the schools we work with we demand that staff coming to support who take children away do not speak to them do not speak to the child about the incident why would we speak to the child about the incident when we haven't had a chance to speak to the teacher and if you need to impose sanctions if you need to remind that child of the correct expectations that should be you doing that don't defer it to someone else otherwise what they do is they play nice to the senior leaders and they are deliberately undermining you so it's more work it's a bit of effort but nobody is claiming that this behavior management thing is easy it's hard you got to be determined drip feeding every day resilient clean sheet you know it's tough but but the advice you're getting and the course that you're on is the stuff that works. You know, we, we work with hundreds of schools all over the country in different contexts and internationally. And we see this, this practice working day after day after day. Uh, and one of the things we keep saying to schools is stop looking for magic dust. Stop looking for the next big strategy led toolkit. You've got the answers. You, you need to use these as the basis and work on that. The school I was in today have done exactly that. And you know what? Uh, they are a year down the line since they launched their new policy and they've had their training. I went into the referral room today, which is the room where children are put when they're thrown out of lessons. There were no children in it. And the staff have now said, we're gonna close down the referral room. I went into the internal exclusion room. There were no children in it. This is a, f a school of 1,400 children coming off large estates in difficult parts of West London with all the social economic problems that you would expect and in, in a school of 1400 children there was nobody sent out of a lesson that is is not just evidence of this working it's evidence of those teachers grabbing this stuff and going Do you know what we're not we're not going to look for another answer this is it and we're going to make this work and they have that's great, Paul. Thank you so much. Interesting stuff coming in in the last couple of minutes. Um, people talking about, you know, essentially reparation, which is what we're, you yeah. know, really starting to talk about in terms of what you do when you have to get a student out of the classroom. Yeah. That we're all going to cover. And we're going to cover That's all unit that five, in, isn't in it? week five. Yeah. Um, and interestingly, as well, somebody's saying, "Oh, I wish I." done this course a year ago or two years ago and I could have really used these strategies then but of course I think a nice way to finish is by acknowledging the fact that teaching and professional development is ongoing and you learn something one year and then you put it into plan and you put it into place and then the next year you improve upon that mm. and you can't absorb everything straight away so you know you kind of have to keep going no I, and I wish as well that when I started teaching that I'd had any advice on behavior management it, it's easy to imagine that sitting here and I've got an online course and we're doing webinars that I you know that I've always been good at behavior management the truth is that I struggled uh, like Ellie struggled like we all struggled in our first year working with very challenging groups in very difficult circumstances and I didn't have any training at university on behavior management N nobody even in the school gave me any training and and it wasn't until I searched out uh, you know uh, advice uh, like this and, and people that, were, that really knew their stuff that, that I started to learn so yeah it's it's it it, we always wish we'd had the ideas we got now a few years ago, but that doesn't mean that we can't grab them now and start planning how we're going to introduce them in the next year. It's quite a good time, isn't it? I mean, you know, you've got, in the, if you're in the UK, you've got five weeks. If you're in the US, you're already on holiday uh, and you're going to get a big summer holiday where you can rejig it all. What I tend to do is if I'm going to start something new in September with the learners, and particularly learners if I've had them before last year and I was doing, using a different system, I'll be honest with them. I walk in, I'll say, I've been doing some thinking over the summer. 
I've been doing some thinking about how we can raise the expectations and raise uh, the quality of behavior in this room. And I'm gonna introduce you to a new system that we're going to be using from day one. And I think just being honest about that and saying what we did last year, I'm going to improve upon, is a really good model for your learners as well. Mm. Great, thanks so much Paul. And Thank you very um, much everyone. We'll say goodbye now, but don't forget that if you have questions or comments, you can post them up in the forum. Do get in touch with us um, and join the Pivotal mailing list as well. And um, we will keep in touch with you and give you lots of tips and things. We will. Don't forget the Pivotal podcast as well. It's free on our website. There are 74 episodes. And this week is about managing behaviour in a special school. So it could be really interesting for some of you out there as well. Brilliant. Thanks, Paul. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, everyone. And see you in a couple of weeks. Have a good evening. See you in a couple of weeks for the next webinar. Brilliant. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.